Let's speak live to journalist John White, who joins us. Thanks, John. Um, first, we, we've recently heard from the White House that um, they could be ready to deploy military in Iraq. Uh, that is only, though, they say, once uh, a new inclusive government is formed. Now, how does that stand with President Obama's assurances that there will not be boots on the ground? Well, isn't it ironic that uh, just three years after US troops left Iraq, uh, in a worse state uh, in which they found it, we're now contemplating US troops returning to Iraq in large number. Um, only those who've had their humanity surgically removed could fail to be moved by the plight of these poor people in northern Iraq right now. And as such, uh, any uh, efforts to alleviate their plight in the short term must be welcome. However, the cause of a problem can never be its solution going forward. And this is why Washington's role here must be as part of a coalition and certainly not taking charge of any military action. So I would suggest that they go to the UN. Remember the UN? that was supposed to be the arbiter of international law. It seems to be bypassed more and more by the West and its allies. Uh, to get a grand coalition, which would have to include Russia, would have to include uh, China, would have to include Iran, uh, we have to include all the state actors in the region who have a role to play. And we really have to look at the reorientation of Western foreign policy in the Middle East that has to take place, because right now we have a situation where the West is opposing ISIS rebels in northern Iraq, and rightly so, but has been tacitly or implicitly uh, supporting them in Syria. It's madness. Yeah, I'd just like to pick, on that, pick up on that, John, because the Free Syrian Army as part of the Syrian opposition, they've pledged their uh, allegiance to the Islamic State. Now, this Syrian opposition, it, it's, it, it's a force that was long supported, nurtured, you might say, by the US. So do we not see a situation now where the US are actually having to turn their, their sights on a force that they were actually rearing for quite a long period? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, the entire focus of US stroke Western foreign policy in the region has been to isolate Syria, isolate Iran and bolster Israel. And that's now blown back in their faces. So if they are interested in uh, alleviating uh, and putting out the fire that is raging across the Middle East, they have to understand that the divide in the region right now is not between Sunni and Shia. It's not between Muslim and non-Muslim. It's between sectarian and non-sectarian. So their role must be to isolate non-sectarian uh, forces and to bolster non-sectarian forces. So they have to also look at the relationship with the Saudi Arabian uh, kleptocracy, the Qataris, uh, the Kuwaitis, the Gulf states, who are fomenting and funding this chaos in the region and have been for quite a number of years now. OK, John, let's just turn briefly to finance. I just want to take a quick look at the possible costs that today's strikes could be uh, incurring upon the American taxpayers because launching an uh, F-18 Hornet fighter jet, that costs around $16,000 an hour. Uh, the laser-guided bombs, which have been dropped on jihadists, they come in at $21,000 each. Uh, we don't know how many bombs were used today, but local reports are suggesting there were at least six airstrikes. I mean, this is early, early days, but um, already quite a lot of money will have been spent in these uh, early uh, efforts. Now, do you think that the American taxpayers already bore the brunt of a very expensive war in Iraq the last time out? Do you think they will be ready to pay for this violence and the expense once again? Well, certainly not. Here we see the growing uh, disconnect between the uh, American public and their political class in Washington. Uh, when it comes to war, when it comes to subverting regimes all across the world, uh, when it comes to going to war in service to US corporate business interests, there seems to be a limitless amount of money uh, in, in, within the US government. But when it comes to alleviating the poverty, the growing inequality in the US, uh, Detroit is bankrupt. The, you know, there's third world levels of poverty in most American cities. Uh, there's no money. Uh, this obviously cannot obtain. And so I don't think that the Obama administration has much weight and ha carries much credibility uh, with regard to putting boots on the ground or engaging in a sustained military effort in the region or anywhere else for that matter. Now ISIS has been uh, calling on its members to target uh, pretty much all-encompassing US interests worldwide. Uh, the US has been very vocal about its war on terror. Do you think that perhaps that's now coming back to haunt them to an extent? 
Oh, it, it clearly is. Since 9-11, the path taken, certainly by the, the George W. Bush administration, has been an absolute disaster for the US, for the West, but certainly for millions of people in the Middle East who are suffering the depredations of the chaos that's been sown. And so, as I said earlier, there has to be a major reorientation in Western foreign policy towards the region. This short-termist idea that you can play with fire, that you can grab a tiger by the tail, that you can support rebels and fanatics, uh, and then hopefully it'll go away, uh, is, is clearly unraveling uh, before our eyes. So unless there is a major reorientation, the, co the chaos will get worse. There has to be an end to the hypocrisy and double standards, support for the apartheid state of Israel and its massacre of women and children in Gaza as we speak, uh, attempts to undermine one of the only non-sectarian governments in the region right now, the Syrian government, uh, and, and supporting proxies, whether it's in uh, Ukraine or whether it's in the Middle East or anywhere else in the world, this must come to an end. OK, thanks so much for uh, giving us your take on this. Joining us from the UK, that's journalist John White. Thank you.